Oh, Sarah, did you get the gift I sent you? The lobster must have been delicious, right? <laughs> I replied to Karen's words. My eldest son ate it all by himself. What? Karen's voice trembled as she responded, and she suddenly started panicking. Go check on your son, please. I retorted to her frantic request. No way, and dismissed it. However, reluctantly following her advice, I headed towards the bathroom near my eldest son's bedroom and witnessed an unbelievable scene. My name is Sarah. I'm turning 60 this year. I married my husband at 19 and was blessed with three children. At 20, I had my eldest son, Mike, and at 23, I gave birth to twin daughters, Betty and Emma. Now all three are married. My eldest daughter lives far away in Spain. It was lonely when she left, but my younger daughter moved to the next town after getting married and now lives in an apartment near her in-laws. And my eldest son's family has been living with us. It's a blessing to have two of them nearby. In this rural area, it's common for families to live with their eldest son and multi-generational households aren't rare. The tradition of passing down the family home to the eldest son is still strong here. Naturally, we plan to hand our house over to our eldest son. My husband owns several properties, so we have a decent passive income. Yet we live modestly and happily. We don't indulge in luxuries, but we can afford gifts for our grandchildren. Especially for my eldest daughter, who I can't see often. I regularly send gifts, which she always appreciates. She had a boy and a girl a few years ago. Though we can't see each other often, the grandchildren always call us via video chat to thank us for the gifts. That's one of my joys. My younger daughter has a big family with three boys and a girl. She works, but her eldest recently started playing soccer, so she seems particularly busy. Sometimes we take care of her children at our house, and my eldest son and his wife have a boy. They live with us, but he doesn't talk to me much lately maybe because he's in his rebellious phase. However, having many grandchildren and seeing them all healthy and well is my happiness. But living together brings its own set of problems. In the past, a mother-in-law's word was law, and I never dared to defy mine. She was strict. I don't want to be like that, but there are things I must teach. Living here in the countryside, there's a minimum level of community and family interaction that my eldest son needs to know or he'll struggle. That's why I asked Karen, my daughter-in-law, to help with things like arranging Christmas cards and gifts for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Since we own properties and my eldest son is set to inherit them, these relationships are very important. I often tell him this. However, he responds with, You're so annoying. Leave me alone. And seems to dislike me and my husband who supports me. And when I talk to Karen, she doesn't want to help either. Come Thanksgiving, she'd say she's traveling with friends and leave the house. And for Christmas, she'd go to her parents' house from mid-November through the New Year's holidays. I never tell her not to go. In fact, I think she should visit her parents. But such a long holiday break is unheard of. And Karen's parents live in the same city, just in a neighboring school district. They could meet any time, not just during the holidays. So while I'm dissatisfied with her long visits home, I end up doing the end-of-the-year cleaning of our large house all by myself. Seeing my struggle, my younger daughter and her children started helping out a few years ago, which has been a relief, but I really think it's Karen's responsibility, as she lives here. I've mentioned it to my eldest son, but he doesn't seem to say anything to Karen. And my son, busy with work, doesn't bother to help either. Contrastingly, my younger daughter helps with arranging presents and making Christmas cards even on her precious days off. She's truly a godsend. I've had my reservations about Karen's behavior in everyday life. She's a stay-at-home mom and is home every day. She does drive the grandkids to and from school and tutoring, but she doesn't do housework. She barely manages the laundry but only their own clothes, never touching ours. I've compromised, thinking it's okay as long as they handle their own laundry. After all, family or not, they're still other people. 
I thought it would be great if we could just do it for ourselves. However, she'll say, Sarah, I'm leaving the laundry here, dumping muddy clothes or items needing hand washing into our basket, as if expecting me to do it. I recall since the grandkids were babies, I've been the one washing anything stained or needing hand washing. It didn't bother me before, but should I always be the one to do it? I once confronted her. Karen, wash your son's dirty clothes yourself. Don't just put them in our laundry basket. Her response was exaggerated. Of course, I'll do it when I can, but a little help would be nice, wouldn't it? I was taken aback by her words. I wanted to throw those words right back at her. I'm the one who wants family cooperation. There have been many such incidents. Her attitude, the local customs, the long-standing traditions? I think they're the cause, and I understand why she might dislike them. Being family doesn't mean you don't need to be considerate. That's why I've always tried to be accommodating towards Karen. I've never forced her to attend gatherings. I've done what I can myself. Karen may be as she is, but there's no doubt she supports my eldest son and is devoted to the grandchild. We've managed to live together for over ten years by finding a middle ground. And now we're in December again. Today is my 60th birthday. But there's no celebratory mood, just as busy as every year. Karen went to her parents' house about a half a month ago. In the evening, thinking I'd like something nice for my birthday dinner. I'm home, I heard from the entrance. Oh, Mike, you're early. It was my eldest son. He seems to have finished work early today. He handed me a large package. Here, for your 60th celebration. The bag was from a department store. I was surprised. Usually my husband doesn't even respond properly when I talk to him. Even now, not a word of happy birthday. But the fact that he thought enough to celebrate touched me. Thank you. I'm so happy. My son gruffly said he'd change and left. My husband peeked in. What's that? Just something. I went back to the dining room and opened it. But the moment I saw what it was inside, I froze. Quite a fancy lobster, my husband said with a wry smile. He knows I have a shellfish allergy. Although it's not severe, just some itching if I eat it. My eldest son should know too, but it's no issue for cooking. After all, he always loved lobster, so it's often been on our table. I only avoid eating it, so maybe he forgot. I felt a bit disappointed, but mostly I was happy. With that in mind, I set the lobster on the table, which instantly looked lavish, and just made a simple meal with some frozen mackerel I had. My eldest son came back after showering. My husband then headed to the bathroom. Such a magnificent lobster. Thank you. I called out to my son from the kitchen. Yeah. He replied shortly, then looked away and sat down at the dining chair. Let's all eat together. My son started eating without responding. He's always been gruff and quiet. But it seems to have gotten worse since he got married. Maybe he doesn't like how I talk to Karen. So I've been keeping my distance from him lately. But seeing his eyes light up at the sight of the lobster was just like when he was a child. I was happy, hoping for a family meal just between us today. My husband returned, and both of us sat down at the table. However, I was surprised when I saw the table. But I was shocked to see the lobster was just a shell. Where's the lobster? I asked my son. I ate it. You're allergic, Mom. He said nonchalantly. Stunned, my husband spoke for me. What do you mean? You sent her lobster knowing she can't eat it? It's better than nothing, right? My son didn't seem remorseful. Feeling pathetic for being happy and saddened by my son's actions, I quietly finished my meal and retreated to my room. What's the big deal? Turning 60 isn't special. If I can enjoy it, that's all that matters. My son said dismissively, and my husband scolded him. After calming down, I came out of my room. My husband and son were still in a tense mood. I'll thank Karen for you. She prepared it, after all. My son told me amidst the tension. 
Why should Sarah thank Karen? My husband yelled. Enough, Henry. It's my fault for being happy about it. My son, showing anger, left the dining room. Feeling sorry for my husband, who looked at me with pity, I silently started cleaning up. Then I showered and went to the bedroom alone, leaving my husband behind. Entering the bedroom, I saw a missed call on my phone. It was Karen. It was late. But maybe she needed something, so I called her back. Hello, Karen? Ah, Sarah, did you get the gift? Yes, I responded briefly to her question. Was the lobster delicious? I replied to Karen. The thing is, I have a mild allergy to shellfish. Mike ate it all by himself. What? Karen's voice trembled in response, and she suddenly sounded panicked. Mike, where is he now? I don't know. Maybe in his room. It's been quite a situation. When I said that, she sounded distraught. Please go check on him. I won't. I refused. He'll come out if he feels remorseful. It's not about that. Karen sounded frantic. I asked in response to the visibly panicked state. What's going on? Why are you in such a hurry? Just go quickly. Reluctantly, I went to my eldest son and his wife's bedroom. It had been quite a while since my eldest son went to bed. I assumed he would be asleep by now, but I knocked and called out. Mike, are you sleeping? There was no answer. Seems he's asleep. I spoke to Karen, who was on the other end of the phone call. I'll be right back, Karen said before hanging up. What was that about? I was about to return to the bedroom when it happened. Mom! A pained voice called out, making me look up. Mike? The voice was coming from the bathroom at the back of the second floor. The door was wide open, and I could see half of Mike's figure. What's wrong? I couldn't help but raise my voice. Call an ambulance! Hearing my eldest son's pained voice, I called my husband and immediately phoned for an ambulance. I felt responsible. Honestly, that's what I thought. He must have caused himself gastroenteritis from overeating. After eating lobster, he had finished all the rice even after I left the room. I got into the ambulance with him, and my husband followed in the car. It was night, but they examined him right away. I got a call from Karen, and when I told her we were heading to the hospital in an ambulance, she hurried over. Mike! She called out our son's name as she burst into his hospital room. For now, he was on an IV drip, going back and forth between the toilet and bed, but the doctor said his symptoms should settle down with time. I left our son in Karen's care and returned home with my husband. It's overeating. His own fault, Henry said, echoing my thoughts. With Karen by our son's side, there seemed to be no need to worry. We rested easy that day and went to the hospital again the next day. Food poisoning? The next day, the doctor informed my husband and me of our son's diagnosis. It seemed it wasn't just overeating after all. When asked if anything comes to mind, I said, We did eat mackerel yesterday. Mackerel? It could be anachysiasis. His symptoms have settled, so we can perform an endoscopy. The doctor suggested, that would be best. We need to know the cause. I agreed, but the mackerel had been frozen and thoroughly cooked. I couldn't imagine it harboring anisakiasis. As I pondered this, the doctor explained the situation to my son. My son agreed to the endoscopy and changed into the examination gown provided by the nurse. The hospital room was now just me, my husband, my son, and my grandson, Tom. Today happened to be a Saturday. My grandson, who was off from school, had come from Karen's parents' house early this morning. It's all because of the meal Mom made, my son said, glaring at me. I had no words to return. Though not intentional, I felt responsible. Why are you changing? Karen, who had just returned, asked. Come to think of it, I hadn't seen her for a while. She must have been in the bathroom. I explained what the doctor had told me. 
What? Is he okay to have an endoscopy when he's feeling sick? Karen voiced her concern. I'm in pain, too, and would rather not do it. But the symptoms aren't going away. It might be anasychiasis, causing peritonitis. If it gets worse, it could even lead to surgery. And it's all because of Mom. Hearing my eldest son's words, Karen also looked at me. But that mackerel was frozen. Anasychiasis should be okay if it's frozen, right? And it was well cooked. But look at me now, my son shouted at me angrily. Mom, is what you just said true? The nurse who entered the room asked, opening the door. It was a relief to see her. It was my daughter, Emma. She worked as a nurse in this hospital. We had informed them yesterday that we were Emma's family. Having come to work, Emma must have heard from someone and come to check on us. Ah, good morning, I greeted my daughter. But is it true about the mackerel being frozen? It's true. It was properly frozen. Upon hearing this, Emma hurried out of the room. Shortly after, the doctor returned and asked me for confirmation. Sarah, I heard the mackerel was frozen. Is that true? I nodded at his words. Then the likelihood of anachysiasis is extremely low. Anachysiasis are fine if frozen. Eating that wouldn't cause food poisoning. Did you eat anything else that might be of concern? His words made me ponder. I had thought it was all because of the mackerel I cooked. And I thought again. Yesterday, we had mackerel soup and sautéed spinach. My husband and I ate it too, but we feel fine. Then, I remembered something. Oh, but my son ate lobster alone. I didn't miss the change in Karen's expression at my words. Come to think of it, Karen had been disturbed the moment I mentioned yesterday that my eldest son had eaten lobster. She was the one who had urged me to go to the bedroom in a hurry. Thanks to her, I found my son in bad shape in the bathroom. Karen, do you know something? I asked. She stiffened. Karen? My son also called out to her. Karen fell silent. At that moment, their son, Tom, stopped playing his game and said, Is that the lobster Mom bought a month ago? A month ago? My eldest son, my husband, and I all turned our gaze to our grandson. Yeah, the one I've been keeping in my room for a month. I took it with me when I went back to Grandpa's house yesterday, and I gave it to Dad. At his words, I turned pale. My eldest son also questioned her. What do you mean? Wasn't it bought yesterday? Then she began to speak. So what? You're the one who said you'd send lobster for her 60th birthday celebration. That's why I brought it when it was cheap. What's wrong with that? Why were you hiding it in Tom's room? My eldest son yelled at Karen. You were the one who said Sarah was being annoying, and it was just to irritate her. I thought a little stomach pain would do. I meant I wouldn't eat something I can't because I'm allergic to shellfish, just to spite her by eating it in front of her. Listening to their argument, my husband seemed completely angry. Both of you are to blame. Apologize to Sarah. My husband's yelling echoed in the hospital room. I calmed him down. It was clear that both had acted with malice. We can't keep them in our house anymore, I declared. They stopped their arguing. I'm sorry, I went too far. My eldest son apologized, confused by my calm demeanor. Right, I can't even think of you as my son anymore. Leave the house once you're discharged. My husband added. Please wait, Henry, I'm really sorry. Karen collapsed on the spot. In the end, Mom was fine, so please forgive us, my son said, trying to gauge our reaction. But forgiveness was not in my heart. Take care, then. I said only that, and we left the hospital, leaving the two behind. According to my daughter, they continued to blame each other after we left. Mike, Karen, calm down. Emma tried to sue them, but the fight didn't stop. Emma, can I go home now? Tom, fed up with his parents, had returned to our house first. I hadn't even noticed his return since he went straight to his room. 
Ultimately, the atmosphere between the two remained hostile even after discharge. Karen stopped washing my son's clothes, and of course, I had no intention of doing it either. Eventually, they got divorced. Karen left our house with Tom. She was a daughter-in-law who often stayed away long and was absent when needed. I had been considerate all this time, but somehow, I felt relieved. Let's live together happily like before, my eldest son suggested, but my husband got furious again and finally kicked him out of the house. We transferred the ownership of our properties and house to our eldest and second daughters. Although there was a gift tax, my husband laughed, <laughs> saying it was better than leaving it to someone we disliked. The husbands of our daughters thanked us, and they redid the celebration for my 60th birthday. At that time, our eldest daughter came back from Spain to our house after several years, and we all had a great time. Seeing our grandchildren's smiling faces, I was truly happy. Later, our second daughter's family moved from their apartment to our house. Their apartment was our property, too. We transferred its ownership to her, and it started generating rental income. Our eldest daughter was overjoyed as well, saying that thanks to the property she inherited, the whole family could visit us several times a year. Spending time with our real daughters was effortless and very relaxing. The family grew larger, and my husband seemed happy. Although I sometimes had to be careful around my second daughter's husband, he was a kind man who always looked after us. Honestly, I still can't forgive my eldest son and my ex-daughter-in-law, nor do I intend to in the future. But my eldest daughter taught me something. There's a Spanish proverb, Living well is the best revenge. Don't you think it's a good saying? Betty said with a smile. Yes, it is. I smiled back. If there's any revenge to be had, it's for my husband and me to live happily. My name is Emily. I have a husband and a son named Richard who has reached adulthood. A few years ago, my son moved out. Now, my husband and I live together in a spacious house. At first, I felt lonely after my son left, but now I'm used to it. However, I'm always happy when I get a call from him saying he's coming home. On the day my son was coming home, my husband and I were excited from the morning. It was before our son told us, I want you both to be at home because I have someone I want to introduce. Before noon, my son came home with a lovely woman. I had expected it from his words, but I never thought he would actually bring a woman home. Seeing our surprise, my son proudly introduced her. Her name is Karen. Isn't she cute? She's my proud wife. I couldn't understand my son's words right away. After thinking for a moment, I asked again, Richard, did you just call Karen your wife, not your girlfriend? My son nodded in agreement. I did. Uh, maybe you're going deaf, mom? I couldn't laugh back at my son's teasing laughter. I haven't heard about you getting married. Did you know about this? I asked my husband and he shook his head. Uh, no, I didn't hear about it either. My husband and I asked our son, what's going on? Then, for some reason, our son proudly explained, uh, that's why I came to announce our marriage registration today. By the way, we uh, had a grand wedding in Bali with friends. My husband and I were speechless at this unexpected explanation. Our son, oblivious to our reaction, kept talking about how wonderful the wedding in Bali was. I held my aching head and carefully asked my son, You have already registered and had the wedding? Why weren't we invited? Then Karen, who had been silent, spoke up. Do we need to invite strangers? I was shocked by her unexpected words. Karen calmly said, Isn't it a waste of money? I couldn't help but respond emotionally. No, no, we are Richard's parents. Karen seemed unconvinced and said with a dissatisfied look, But you're strangers to me. I was confused and fell silent. My son must have finally noticed the tense atmosphere and began to explain hurriedly. Uh, Karen has no parents or siblings. It would be sad if she was the only one without family at the wedding, right? That's why I didn't invite you guys. Hearing Karen's situation, I couldn't say anything back. I thought, if that's the case, maybe it can be helped. 
Of course, I wasn't completely satisfied, but I told myself it was too late since the wedding was already over. After the newlyweds left, I confided in my husband. I wonder if those two will be okay. My husband seemed to share my concern but said, It's their decision, they're already married, all we can do is watch over them, and sighed. Although I agreed with my husband's opinion, I couldn't leave it at that, so I decided to try to close the distance with Karen. I got my son's phone number and decided to get in touch. When Karen realized it was me on the phone, her voice immediately turned sour. What do you want? I thought I had made her uncomfortable by calling out of the blue, so I quickly explained my reason. Um, I got some delicious treats, so I thought I'd bring them over to you next time. Then Karen said, Oh, I don't need that. In fact, I don't even plan to give you my address. I couldn't help but ask, What? Karen calmly answered, I don't want to give personal information to strangers. Please, delete my phone number. Before I could say anything else, the call was disconnected. After that, I couldn't get in touch with Karen. What I did must have been an unnecessary intrusion to Karen. Feeling down, my husband told me, There's still time, uh, don't rush. Forcing closeness won't necessarily lead to good results. Just hope that she'll open her heart to us someday. I cooled my head and nodded. You're right. A month after, I stopped trying to contact my son and his wife. My son suddenly got in touch. What's going on? I asked, and he told me Karen was pregnant. I was thrilled by the happy news. I thought it would be tough for a first-time mother without her parents, so I asked for their address to go help. But my son said, Uh, no, uh, I can't give you the address. We don't need help, just money. Give me your bank account number so I'll transfer it. I tried to explain to my son how difficult childbirth could be, but he wouldn't listen. Moreover, he said that Karen herself was against it. In the end, I transferred only the money as my son wanted. After that, I never heard from my son again. There was not even a report of the child's birth. After a year had passed, I tried to call my son several times, but eventually, I couldn't reach him at all. My son may no longer think of us as family. Even if I want to confirm it, there is no way to get in touch. Feeling helpless one day, I met a familiar person at the local supermarket. At first, I didn't recognize him, but thanks to him calling out to me, I realized who he was. Uh, it's been a long time. Do you remember me? I I'm David. Johnson's David? Hearing the name, my memory came back. He was a friend my son often brought home during high school. I didn't recognize him at first because he was still a high school student in my memory. David, you've grown up so well. As I looked at him closely and called his name, David seemed pleased and a bit shy. Suddenly, I caught the eye of the woman next to David. She had a matching ring with David and her belly was noticeably large. I involuntarily covered my mouth and exclaimed, Oh my! David nodded shyly. Uh, this is my wife Olivia. Our child is due in two months. Olivia, is it? Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Olivia looked confused for a moment but soon smiled happily. After brief greetings, we quickly parted ways, not wanting to burden the expectant mother. Two months after reuniting with David, I received an email from him. In fact, we had exchanged contact information at the time of our reunion because he wanted to announce the birth. Attached to the email was a picture of the newborn baby. It was a very cute baby. Suddenly, I imagined my own grandchild, whom I had never seen, and shed a few tears. I emailed David, saying I wanted to send a gift to celebrate. Then... A flustered David called me. Uh, I didn't connect you with that intention, so please don't trouble yourself. I couldn't help but laugh at David's apologetic tone. That's not it. I just want to celebrate since I can't do anything for my own grandchild. David was silent for a while before asking, Something happened with Richard, didn't it? As I remained silent, David began to speak. I was hesitant to tell you this, but actually... David's story was shocking. Olivia was originally Richard's uh, girlfriend, but Richard chose another woman and unilaterally dumped Olivia. That woman was Karen. Olivia was devastated after being abandoned by Richard. I couldn't leave her like that. I tried to persuade Richard several times, but he wouldn't listen. I gave up trying to convince him and stopped being friends with him. David's story ended there for the moment. I thought I couldn't forgive my son or Karen, even if he was my own child at the same time. I realized that my actions had reminded Olivia of her painful past. 
Even though I didn't know I did something terrible to Olivia, she probably didn't want to meet Richard's mother. I'm really sorry for casually saying I wanted to celebrate it. When I apologized, David hurriedly denied it. You don't need to apologize, Mrs. Smith. Olivia doesn't mind. She was the one who wanted to sell the baby's picture. Please don't apologize, Mrs. Smith. I felt even more guilty at their kindness. David hesitated and then said, I just don't want to involve Olivia with Richard and his wife ever again. I agreed wholeheartedly. I'll help as much as I can. Though there may not be much I can do, I also revealed to David my relationship with my son and his wife. David was truly appalled to learn of Richard's recent behavior. Afterward, we changed the subject and only talked about cheerful things before hanging up. I told my husband about what I had heard from David. Then I informed him that I would consider Richard and his family as strangers from now on. My husband agreed with me. At least we can take a breather. I looked around the room where most of the unpacking was done and nodded. Our new life begins here today. Originally, the house we had lived in was too large, just for the two of us. When we were considering moving, we were introduced to this newly built high-rise condominium. We were supposed to tell our son about it, but we decided against it. I decided to go out to buy ingredients for dinner. The moment I stepped out of the front door, someone called out to me, Mom? I turned around thinking it couldn't be, and there was my son. He approached with a light smile. Oh, uh, why didn't you tell me you move? I was surprised to find strangers at the old house. I had to search quite a bit to find you. I looked at my son with stern eyes. I didn't need to tell you. You're a stranger to me. Richard finally seemed to realize that my attitude had changed and became flustered. What are you talking about? I'm your son. I ignored Richard and started walking. Richard hurriedly walked beside me and began to talk. Uh, Mom, I'll apologize for everything up until now. I was just deceived by Karen. You must have some extra money if you're living in a new high-rise condominium like this, right? Richard was making a fuss beside me, but I ignored him and kept walking. Seeing my unchanging attitude, Richard seemed to think the situation was bad and began to speak anxiously. Karen was a habitual liar. Her claim of having no family was a lie. She had only been disowned by her parents after causing a romantic problem at her previous job. When I glanced at my son, he misunderstood something and continued to badmouth Karen. Uh, Karen approached me for money when she couldn't live alone after quitting her job. I, I was just deceived. My son insisted he was the victim. So let me live in that high-rise condominium too? I stopped and looked at my son's face. He seemed happy, thinking I was finally willing to listen. But I kept my stern eyes on Richard and said, You chose that wicked woman even though you were dating someone else is the result of your actions. My son was astonished at my words. I delivered the decisive words to my son. Your only family is Karen. You two are a perfect match. Leaving my son standing there, I left the scene. I then contacted David. I thought my son might cause trouble for David or Olivia. Sure enough, my son tried to apologize to Olivia and ask David to mediate between us. Moreover, he said something nonsensical like, You two got married because of me. David, at his wit's end, declared he was cutting ties with my son and threatened to call the police if he persisted. My son apparently fled in a panic. Afterwards, my furious son tried to spread bad rumors about the two among common friends, but was instead scorned by them. Karen, who was supposed to be my son's only ally, ran away with another man leaving their child behind as soon as she spent all my son's savings. Afterward, my son fell into a terrible state, but we didn't think of helping him even after hearing the rumors. After a while, my son came to us with the child. You must think it's pitiful for your grandchild, right? Let us stay here. As soon as my son spoke, my husband, who had been silent until then, yelled. Don't be ridiculous. Stop acting like a spoiled child at your age. You're no longer our son but a stranger. Get out. Frightened by our harsh attitude, my son left the grandchild and ran away. My husband quickly locked the front door. I gently picked up the grandchild who had been left behind. The grandchild, not understanding anything, reached out to my husband with a smile. I'm sure that seeing that smile, my husband and I shared the same thought. We have no intention of forgiving our son and Karen in the future, but the child is innocent. 
we nodded to each other, we decided to raise this child ourselves. I heard rumors that my son is doing physical labor. He must be struggling to make ends meet, having to choose a job he hates involving physical work. Even so, he hasn't tried to force his way back home for now. Well, even if he did, the result would be the same. My husband and I are busy every day focusing on our grandchild. We're not young anymore, so raising a child is quite challenging. But just seeing this child smile gives us the strength to persevere. For things that are too difficult for us, we rely on the help of David and his wife. We can't thank them enough. It seems that the days of enjoying a leisurely retirement are still a way off. But until then, I want to cherish the time with my husband and grandchild. I don't want to invite dirty people into my brand new, beautiful home. That's what Lily told me over the phone. The way Lily spoke, it was as if she thought I had no common sense. Just because she's my son's wife doesn't give her the right to insult me like that. And my son is no better. Stay tuned for a mother-in-law's revenge. My name is Grace and I'm 65 years old. My husband James is 5 years older than me. We live in a lovely house in the suburbs. Our home is filled with antiques and furniture you don't see much of these days all inherited by my husband. Even at 70, James always says, Leave it to me, I'll handle it. He takes care of everything himself. It's amazing how he can work in the garden from morning till night and still be so cheerful. I've been inspired by him. Even after retiring, I didn't just rely on my pension. I work at a friend's lunchbox shop. We have a son, Alexander, who's turning 30 this year. He was our long-awaited child, and I think we might have spoiled him a bit. Still, he's now a proud employee of a listed company and has made a life for himself. He started living on his own in the neighboring state, but still visits us a few times a year. He began dating a young lady named Lily, who's five years younger, and they got married shortly after. Lily, whom he met at work, is a young and very charming woman always smiling and well-groomed. My first impression of Lily was that she looked like a princess from a fairy tale. I was thrilled to think such a beautiful woman would become my daughter-in-law. However, that first impression would soon be tested. About a year after their wedding, while I was checking the lottery numbers, a hobby of my husband's, my son called. Lately, he hadn't visited us, always finding some excuse. It's been a while. What? You want to live with us? Apparently, the apartment they were living in was going to be demolished. They decided to build their own house. And while they had chosen the land and the builder, they needed a place to stay for a few months until their new home was ready. Lily's parents live in an apartment. Our house is big and we have spare rooms, right? I thought it was a great idea. If you two are okay with it, then I guess it's fine. As my son said, we do have unused rooms. There shouldn't be any problem with them living here for a few months. Is your job going to be okay? You do realize the commute will be longer, right? It'll be fine. Lily's a housewife and I can work remotely, so we're counting on you. And just like that, he hung up. I wonder if he really understands. The reason he started living on his own was that the commute took three hours round trip. Did he forget that? Well, he probably considered the convenience of our place before asking, so I shouldn't worry. Above all, I was genuinely happy to live with my son again. Why not? Having young people around will add some zest to our lives, my husband said, laughing cheerfully when I told him about our son's request. A few weeks later, my husband was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. He had slipped on a pedestrian bridge and tumbled down the stairs during a walk. When the paramedics called, a chill ran down my spine. Fortunately, he survived, but he had damaged a part of his brain during the fall and was diagnosed with a high-level brain dysfunction. It might be challenging for him to continue his daily life as before. He'll need rehabilitation. And if he's discharged and comes home, he'll need care, possibly from a live-in caregiver or you. 
The doctor's words brought me to tears in front of someone else for the first time at this age. Given the current situation, I couldn't visit him often, which stressed me out. But when I did see my husband during the short visiting hours, he looked mostly the same. Despite his complaints about wanting to come home, I couldn't bear the thought of sending him to a nursing home. So, I decided to bring him home once he was discharged. After a while, my son and his wife finally came to visit. According to them, they were busy with house-related matters and couldn't find the time. They have their own lives. I swallowed my complaints. More importantly, I had something to tell them. I explained that with my husband's care needs, living together might be challenging. So, I'm sorry for the sudden change, but let's forget about the living together plan. We don't mind at all. It's okay. What do you mean you don't mind? I was taken aback by Lily's response. Many families live like this. It's not a big deal. Plus, we'll be kicked out of our apartment in a couple of months. Do you expect us to find a new place just for a few months? With a puzzled look, Lily blurted out her thoughts. I understood her logic, but something about the way Lily said it bothered me. My son, sitting next to Lily, nodded in agreement. He finally spoke up. You know, I might be too busy, but since Lily's a housewife, she can help out with a lot of things, right? Lily responded with a bright smile. Their behavior was a bit concerning, but I was about to face the challenges of caregiving for the first time. If living with my son and his wife meant getting some help, I'd be grateful. Alright then, welcome. They seemed pleased with my response and left. Soon after my husband was discharged from the hospital, my son and his wife arrived with loads of luggage. They stuffed everything into the spare room. Without unpacking, they both left to meet some old friends from town. It was like a whirlwind. Oh well. They've been away for a while, so I should cut them some slack for today. I sighed and returned to caregiving and house chores. The doctor was right. My husband had changed completely. He had moments of clarity, but he'd often spill food, get distracted by the TV, and even had accidents. He'd get angry or cry over trivial things and would stumble or bump into things in our familiar home. I couldn't take my eyes off him. He was undergoing regular rehab, but I wasn't sure if he understood his condition. I'd secretly sigh when he wasn't looking. Once things settled down, I'd need to discuss my husband's current state with my son. Just knowing I wasn't alone gave me some comfort. I never imagined that comfort would be betrayed. Maybe I was too lenient at the start. Even after moving in, my son would lock himself in his room, claiming he was working remotely. Lily, instead of helping with chores, said she was busy unpacking and stayed in her room. Dinner's ready! Only then would they emerge. I'd only see them during meals or when they went out. They wouldn't help with meal prep or even clean up after eating. I wanted to scold them, but I couldn't take my eyes off my unpredictable husband. Within a week of living together, my frustration with them grew. I couldn't trust them with my husband. I quit my job to focus on caregiving and housework. While I worked tirelessly, they continued their lazy routine. Even when I asked Lily for help, she'd say she would, but never did, leaving me to do everything. Living together was a disaster. Their presence only added to my workload. I was at my breaking point. Mom, you look tired. My son remarked during dinner, pointing at me with his fork. If you think so, then help out. He chuckled. Come on, I'm working, even if it's remote. I'm a bit of a clean freak. I can't do the things you do. Their words filled me with rage. Suddenly, my husband shouted. What are you doing? Look, you spilled the soup. I gently wiped the tiny droplet with a tissue. I'm sorry, Dad. See, it's clean now. Okay. Relieved to see him resume eating, I took a deep breath. Lily, however, frowned and stood up, leaving her dishes behind. I'm done. Some food splashed when he yelled. What? Hey, Alexander, I'm still hungry. Let's go out. Lily wrapped her arm around my son's and spoke in a sweet voice. Without hesitation, my son stood up and said nonchalantly, Fine, we're going to grab some food then. 
Wait, what? How can you just decide that? Even as I tried to stop them, the two left without looking back. With the messy dinner for two left untouched, my husband beside me spoke softly. What a waste. It's so delicious. Hearing his words, she felt a lump in her throat. Every now and then, glimpses of the kind man she married would shine through. Each time, it reaffirmed her love for him. Caring for her husband wasn't easy, but mentally, he was still sharp as ever. You know, the lottery is coming up. Let's buy a ticket. Maybe we'll win more than $3 this year. At that, her husband laughed heartily. She wished to keep things as normal as possible for him. It had been a month since they started living together. Timing it when her husband was having his therapy session, she called the two who seldom helped around. Look, I'm not asking you to care for him, but could you at least help a bit with the chores? She explained her husband's condition in detail once more, but they seemed indifferent. Look, to someone old-fashioned like you, it might seem like we're just lazing around, but we're busy with work and planning for our home. I'm swamped preparing for our new place. The only break I get is going out once in a while. She wanted to say that since her husband's discharge, they hadn't been out and she barely slept. But she swallowed her words. Her husband was the one truly suffering. So, you're too busy to help. Can you at least contribute a bit to the household expenses? That's harsh, mother-in-law. We're a young couple and we'll need money for our future. She shot a cold glare at Lily's teary eyes. Ever since they moved in, the food and electricity bills had definitely increased. It was obvious. They blasted the air conditioner all day and used many electronic devices. And the food? If they didn't like the menu, they'd leave most of it. You too might not get it, but living costs money. Isn't it common sense to contribute if you're staying for more than a month? At her words, Lily pursed her lips and muttered, If we have to pay, what's the point of agreeing to live together? What did you say? I couldn't believe my ears at Lily's words. Lily smiled as if nothing happened. If you need money, maybe stop wasting it on lottery tickets. Save that money instead. That's his only hobby. I won't let you take that away from him. She glared at the smug-looking Lily. Lily, with a shrug and a teasing tone, said, Mother-in-law, you're looking scary. You'll get more wrinkles, you know. Something snapped inside her. Don't mock me when I'm being serious. As she was about to raise her voice, her son loudly tapped the table and sighed. Oh, Mom, you're overreacting. Don't scare my Lily. If caregiving is so hard, just send him to a nursing home. Lily's eyes sparkled at his words. What's with those enchanting eyes? What's with that dreamy look? Does she think he's being brave? He knew his father was mentally sound, yet he said such a thing loudly. Couldn't he imagine how his father would feel if he heard that? Seeing her speechless, her son shook his head in exasperation. You think you've hit the nail on the head, huh? Ugh, so annoying. Always getting irritated. Is it menopause or something? Don't even have the money to put yourself in a nursing home? So, you're asking us for money? That's not the point. Poor mother-in-law. If my old beauty products are okay, I'll give you some serum. You seem broke, so it's on the house. Lily grabbed her son's arm, smiling triumphantly. The couple left the room, side by side. Soon after, the distant sound of the front door closing echoed. A whirlwind of emotions surged, but I couldn't throw out their massive luggage or kick them out on my own. I decided never to live with them again, telling myself it's just a bit longer. Two months later, they seemed to have settled into their new home and finally left. They never contributed to household chores or finances, but at least I was free from the immense stress. Looking forward to your housewarming gift! I watched Lily wave with a blank expression. Honestly, I wasn't in the mood to celebrate for such a couple, but they probably expect something. They might invite us over to their new place at least once. Should we prepare something before they ask? We had just received an unexpected bonus, so spending a bit wasn't a big deal. We decided to buy a decently priced wall clock as a housewarming gift for our son and his wife. It was a beautifully crafted radio-controlled clock with a design that would fit any room. 
We waited for a call from them, but a week passed with no word. Even after what they said, no contact at all. Come to think of it, we don't even know what kind of house they built, let alone their address. It would be too late if something happened to my husband or me. We need to at least know their address for emergencies. I hurriedly called my son. Hello? What's up? After several tries, I finally got through. I had called my son's cell, but it was Lily, sounding quite annoyed, who answered. We haven't heard from you since you moved. You need to tell us your address. Well, if I tell you, you'll come over, right? Of course, we even have a housewarming gift for you. As I said that, Lily laughed coldly, as if mocking me. Hold on, a clock? You think we'd be happy with that? People usually give cash. Guess you're broke. Good thing we didn't tell you our address. I felt anger rising as Lily chuckled and spoke. You asked for a housewarming gift, and now this? That was just being polite. I can't even imagine taking care of your dirty husband, especially not in our brand new house. The demure demeanor she had when they first got married was nowhere to be found. I had my suspicions, but Lily's true nature was worse than I thought. I thought it looked like something out of a fairy tale, and I was kind of right. She was a devil in disguise. Devils only deceive those who are useful to them. We have our house now. There's no benefit in associating with poor, dirty people like you. We don't plan on having anything to do with you anymore. I could picture Lily's face, smirking in contempt. At the same time, something snapped inside me. Soon after, my son came on the line. That's how it is. We don't need your gifts. I feel the same way as Lily. Just live your lives and leave us be. Lily's condescending attitude and my son, who didn't even reprimand her, shocked me. The most surprising was the cold disconnection from the son I had lovingly raised. Any remaining affection for him faded. Oh, I see. From now on, we have nothing to do with each other. If that's how they feel, we'll live our lives without them. This house is too big for just the two of us. We had kept it thinking our son might live here, but its purpose is over. I hung up and started preparing for our future. Several years passed. I was enjoying tea in the living room when my phone rang. An unfamiliar number. Hello? Hi, mother-in-law? It's been a while. Um, I was wondering if you could help us out financially? It was Lily, with her usual sugary tone. I feel very sick. She had racked up nearly $30,000 in debt buying luxury items. My son found out and they were on the brink of divorce. She shocked out of boredom. Why should I give money to someone like you? I asked my parents too, but we're still short. Remember those antiques and dresses you had? Can we sell those? You wouldn't want your dear son to get divorced, right? She had apparently snooped around our house. I've never shown you my dress or told you where it is. I don't care if a stranger gets divorced. Just a little help. With such a big old house, you must have something valuable. We don't have that house anymore. What? I decided to do it the day you all cut ties with me. I sold the land. Now, it's just an empty lot, with tall weeds growing on it. Lily was speechless at my words. Breaking the silence, Lily exclaimed, What? I never heard about this! People don't usually share such things. There's no need to, I replied. I could picture Lily's shocked and flustered face on the other end of the phone. That's old news, isn't it? Is it? It feels like just yesterday, my son was so naive and clueless to be so smitten with someone like you. Lily, seemingly irritated by my words, responded with a challenging tone. Were you so broke that you had to sell the house? Living day by day without a home now? It's really sad to be so poor and pitiful. It seemed like Lily just couldn't resist looking down on me. If she wanted a competition, I was ready. I had money, but I used it all. What? I sold it because I won a lot of money. The lottery ticket that everyone said was a waste? It won me $500,000. $500,000? Neither of us ever thought it would really win. 
When we were wondering what to do with the unexpected windfall, we received the declaration of disownment. To continue living peacefully as a couple, we used the lottery winnings and the money from selling the house and land to move into a luxury retirement community. Just as you all wished, we both moved into a retirement community. It's in the city center, close to the station, fully equipped with the latest appliances. The staff is always there, and if we ask, gourmet meals are served. Thanks to that, the burden of caregiving has reduced, and both your father and I are living very peacefully. Lily was silent for a while. Just as I was about to hang up, she spoke in a sweet voice, reminiscent of when we first met. Mother-in-law, I've always admired you. Taking care of that messy husband of yours is commendable. I apologize for everything up till now. Can we rebuild our relationship? If you're going to flatter, do it right from the start. I won't give you any money, especially after you treated my precious husband like trash. I could hear Lily panicking on the other end. I ignored her and hung up. A while later, Lily visited our home with her father. It seemed she had investigated based on the information I shared. As soon as I sat down, Lily's father shouted desperately, Why didn't you tell us? From what he said, it seemed Lily had only told her side of the story to her parents. Being forced to live together, being extorted for living expenses. And I shopped because my son wanted me to look good. And despite being rich, my in-laws won't help. And... The newlyweds didn't even give a housewarming gift and sold their family home without telling us the new address. We were both so excited during the family meeting because we had children later in life. It's a parent's duty to do whatever they can for their child's happiness, right? Beside her earnest father, Lily lowered her eyes and sniffled. Her act was Oscar worthy. I almost applauded in my mind. I'm sorry, but it seems there's a significant discrepancy between what your daughter told you and what I experienced from her. Can we clarify? Of course. I smiled warmly and began to list out all the truths I had learned from Lily without any exaggeration. Lily's father was taken aback by my straightforward account, looking completely overwhelmed. All lies, Dad! She's making all of this up. Lily's desperate plea only made my words seem more credible. She might be a great actress, but she wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Would you like to hear the last voicemail she left me? Only if you think you can handle it. Wait, you recorded it? Lily exclaimed in surprise. To be clear, we don't have any money left. Ever since she cut ties with us, We've been preparing for our end. We've already arranged for our funerals and graves. We won't be relying on or helping our son and his wife. And just so you know, whichever one of us passes away first, we willed all our assets to the other. Oh, that's it. Lily's shoulders slumped in disappointment. She probably thought she'd eventually get her hands on our inheritance. Seeing her blatant attitude, her father was shocked. I said firmly, Please leave. Lily and her father left, looking utterly defeated. Just then, my husband, who had been at a recreational activity, returned. Did something happen? Nothing much, just made our stance clear. He tilted his head in confusion, a gesture I found amusing, and I chuckled. Some time later, our son messaged us, apologizing and informing us of his divorce from Lily. He went on to share unsolicited updates about Lily. After the divorce, she moved back to her parents' home, and they took on her debt. And she seems to be working on dating. She's apparently busy dating now, even asking our son if he knows any good men. She's a devilish woman with only her looks going for her. Well, her future is predictable. Our son, while paying off the house loan by himself, came crying for help. You're the one who cut ties, I responded coldly. I thought maybe our feelings for our son would return once the root of all problems, Lily, was out of the picture. But it seems it'll take some time. We're living peaceful and happy days. 
Thanks to the staff, we can even go shopping alone. Our relationship with each other has improved, and we're more at ease. We're known as the most loving couple in the facility. We've even been surprised with celebrations on our anniversaries. We haven't won the lottery since that incident, but we still buy tickets. Look! We won a hundred dollars! I called out to my husband, comparing the winning numbers. What should we do with it? How about a date? He replied with a grin. I couldn't help but blush and smile. When that time comes, I plan to wear the dress I've kept tucked away and head out. I really don't want you at the wedding. I don't want to associate with someone like you who'd resort to illegal means just to be popular with the opposite sex. I wish he'd cut ties with you. You're not fit to be his sister. What are you talking about? Before I could respond, the call ended. That was when Jackson was getting married. My name is Sophia. I have a father, a mother, and a younger brother named Jackson, three years my junior. Both Jackson and I chose colleges close to home to save money, so we lived with our parents. I went to a less prestigious college while Jackson went to a top-ranked one. We continued to live at home even after graduation, choosing jobs nearby. But now, I'm unemployed. My recent company laid off about a hundred employees, and I was one of them. I was in a good position in the company, so I never saw it coming. It's been about two months since I lost my job, but I have some savings. I'm taking my time looking for another job. Jackson, on the other hand, recently got engaged to his girlfriend and is living a charmed life. He's doing well. He earns a good salary, and he even gives money for rent and food to our mom. Mom once tried to refuse his money, saying, You don't have to. But Jackson insisted. Think of it as paying back for all you've done for me. He's such a good brother. We used to fight a lot when we were kids, but since middle school, he's been bigger and stronger, so we stopped fighting. In fact, he even looked up to me when I helped him with his studies. Well, now he's surpassed me in knowledge. As for dad, he and mom have been running a dessert shop for a long time. It doesn't make much, but dad used to work for a big company, so they have a good amount of savings. Seeing our customers smile is what keeps me going, he says, working enthusiastically at the shop every day. One day, as the four of us were having dinner, Jackson said, I'm thinking of getting married. The three of us stopped eating, and Mom was the first to speak. Oh my, that's wonderful news! When can we expect a grandchild? Don't rush things, Mom. And remember, I get to hold the baby first. No objections allowed. Both were clearly thrilled. I was happy for Jackson's happiness too. A few months later, as the wedding preparations were in full swing, my phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number. I answered. Hello? Is this the sister-in-law? I'm Lily, the one getting married to Jackson. Nice to meet you. Apparently, Jackson asked for my number and called me. I had seen her picture before and she was stunning. I wondered where they met. Nice to meet you. I'm Sophia, Jackson's sister. What can I do for you? I really don't want you at the wedding. Someone with your low education willing to use illegal means to be popular with the opposite sex? I don't want to associate with you. I wish he'd cut ties with you. You're not fit to be his sister. She responded cryptically. What do you mean by that? Before I could answer, she hung up. What was that all about? Did I do something wrong? I pondered for about an hour but couldn't think of anything. And why would I? I had never met her before. Yet, she called out of the blue with such a strange request. Isn't it normal for all family members to attend a wedding? Or is this some new wedding trend I'm unaware of? I decided to wait for Jackson to return home and ask him about it. But Jackson didn't come home that day. Apparently, he had decided to live with his fiance before the wedding to ensure a smooth start to their married life. When I told mom about what Lily had said, both she and dad were furious. What is she thinking? A wedding without family? That's ridiculous. Absolutely. I wasn't angry at the time. I wondered if I had unknowingly done something 
or if Lily had been fed false information about me. But my parents' anger didn't subside, and they decided that none of our relatives would attend the wedding. So it seems that no one will go to Jackson's side. According to Jackson, Lily's family members all graduated from top-ranked universities and held prestigious jobs. She felt embarrassed that her fiancé's sister, me, didn't have a stable job and attended a lower-ranked college. Dad was livid. Discriminating based on education? Ridiculous! Jackson apologized to me later, but we never discussed that topic again. When I told Jackson everything Lily had said, he was shocked. What? What does she mean by illegal means? Sis, you didn't do anything like that, right? It seemed Jackson was hearing this for the first time. When I denied it, Jackson said he'd talk to Lily. A few days later, Jackson called. It seems that the truth has been revealed. Apparently, Lily had been suspicious because of the drastic difference between my high school and college photos. That should be it. I was quite chubby in high school. However, after entering university, I realized that I would no longer be popular. So I went on a strict diet and dropped my weight from 220 pounds to 150 pounds. But Lily couldn't believe it. She struggles to lose just 2 pounds, so she believes I must have used illegal means to drop 70 pounds? Given my lower education, she thinks it's plausible. Jackson tried to convince her. She just worked hard on her diet. But Lily wouldn't listen. Even worse, both Lily's father and mother believed her and insisted I shouldn't attend the wedding. I was so taken aback by this that I was at a loss for words. I decided, with my parents' agreement, not to attend the wedding. A few days later, Lily called again. Sister-in-law, you're the worst! Because of what you told me, we were humiliated. What? I didn't do anything. I just chose not to attend. I just didn't attend the wedding. The next day, Jackson called to apologize for Lily's behavior. You let Lily walk all over you, I warned. Jackson replied, I'm sorry, but I can't stand up to her. Apparently, one of Lily's relatives is a major client of Jackson's company. His career and future promotions hinge on staying in this person's good graces. If he upsets them, the business deal could be canceled, and Jackson could lose his job. I was more concerned about Jackson's situation and told him not to worry about it. A week later, Lily called again. I really didn't want to talk to her. Sister-in-law, you're unemployed, but you have a lot of savings, right? If I get pregnant, we want to live on the second floor. Could you move out? It'd be better for our baby. I don't want to say this, but being around someone who'd resort to such means to gain popularity is bad for the child's upbringing. Indeed, my parents live on the first floor and I have a room on the second. She wanted to use my room for their unborn child. Without hesitation, I declined. That's not possible. Goodbye. And I hung up. Although I haven't found a new job yet, I've been making money through Forex trading using my savings, and I contribute more to the household expenses than Jackson does. I was content living with my parents, and I had no plans to marry anytime soon. But I was worried that refusing Lily might affect Jackson's career. The next day, Dad was furious. Why did you refuse to live with them? It's just living together. I always dreamed of living with my grandchild. Are you trying to take that dream away from me? Dad's face is red and angry. I explained everything Lily had said. Dad calmed down. So, they want to kick you out and take over the second floor because you're bad for the baby's upbringing? Unbelievable. But if things continued this way, Jackson would always be under Lily's thumb. That's why Lily always calls me directly, not my mom. I told mom, I'll move out. It should solve everything. Besides, they won't live here forever. Jackson always talked about living in a beautiful, spacious house. Dad was silent for a while, but then said, All right, and hung up. A few days later, I moved out to live on my own. Soon after, Jackson and Lily moved into my parents' house. Lily began preparing two rooms one for their baby and another as their bedroom. Half a year passed. Mom called me. Since they moved in, they haven't paid any living expenses or rent. 
but I can't believe Jackson would do that. I think Lily might be stopping him. Why do you think that? Well, Lily doesn't cook at all, uses the bathroom whenever she wants, and keeps the heater on all winter. The electric bill is sky high. She keeps saying she's about to give birth, but her belly isn't getting any bigger. Apparently, Mom was doing all the housework, including cooking. The next day, I called Jackson. Jackson, how's living with Mom? It's fine. Lily seems to be getting along with Mom. I'm hardly home, but the laundry's always done and the room's clean. Make sure you thank Mom, okay? Thank her? She's doing everything. Laundry, cooking, cleaning. And I heard you're not even paying living expenses or rent. You should at least cover that. What? Lily told me she's doing everything. I give the rent to Lily every week. Are you saying she's not doing anything? It seemed Jackson was clueless. A few days later, Jackson invited everyone for dinner at their place. Mom made lots of pizza, my favorite. It seemed Lily was helping, but Mom told me she was just doing it reluctantly because her relatives and parents were coming. The doorbell rang. It was Lily's parents. As we all sat down, Mom said, I hope you enjoy the meal, even if it's nothing special. It all looks delicious, doesn't it, dear? Yes, it does. Lily's parents complimented the food, making Mom blush. Suddenly, Jackson raised his voice. Before we start eating, can I say something? He turned to Lily. You haven't been paying the rent I gave you to give Mom, have you? And what exactly have you been helping Mom with? What? Money? What are you talking about? Lily looked panicked, glancing at everyone. You told my sister to leave, didn't you? So we could move in. What were you thinking? I always thought Jackson was quiet and focused on his career, but this was different. He seemed serious. Lily, flustered, said, It's your family home. Why should we pay rent? It's not even a mansion, and I do the cleaning. The one actually cleaning is my mom, and where did the rent money I gave you go? Not just the rent, you didn't give her the living expenses either. What did you spend that money on? Turns out, Lily had been enjoying fancy French restaurants with that money. And she'd been treating her friends, too. Lily's parents both turned red and apologized. They didn't know the real reason I didn't attend the wedding or why Lily was so keen on moving in. It's our fault for raising such a daughter. We're truly sorry. Then Jackson turned to Lily's mother and father. I'm considering a divorce. Please think about it. Lily burst into tears. Lily's mother pleaded, Please don't do that, I beg you, and deeply apologized to Jackson. My parents and I were shocked and looked at Jackson, but Jackson didn't stop. He turned to me and said, Sis, I'm truly sorry. We'll move out, so please come back here. I've been weak and let things slide, but I realize I was wrong. I'm so sorry. Jackson said this with tears in his eyes. You don't need to apologize. It's not your fault. But are you serious about the divorce? Jackson, with a serious look, replied, I am. Marrying her was a mistake from the start. She was overly concerned about educational backgrounds and even told you not to come to our wedding. She lied about expecting a baby, kicked you out to live in our family home, and pocketed the rent. Shame on her. Jackson shouted at Lily. Lily cried even louder. The food had gone cold. What a waste. We'll take our daughter and leave now. With her head down, Lily left with her parents. Lily's father pleaded with Jackson to reconsider, but Jackson firmly refused. In the end, Jackson divorced the following week. I could have moved back to my family home as Jackson suggested, but I didn't. Living alone had its perks. Instead, I urged Jackson to return, and he did. Fortunately, Jackson's career wasn't affected. In fact, he was asked to keep the matter private to avoid family embarrassment. Six months later, Jackson left his job to start a new business using his expertise. I'll turn our family's dessert shop into a top-tier company. He was enthusiastic, but Dad seemed a bit puzzled, saying, It's fine the way it is now. As for me, I found a new job and a boyfriend. I plan to introduce him to my parents and Jackson soon. He's quite nervous. While marriage is still a ways off, I vowed to myself never to become a wife like Lily. 
I'm Olive, 35 years old. Since graduating from college, I've worked as an office clerk in the fashion industry. I've always been committed to my job, and it's been like my romantic partner. I climbed the corporate ladder quite smoothly because I love what I do. However, working in a predominantly female company meant fewer chances to meet someone, so my love life was rather limited. Once I hit 30 and saw everyone around me getting married and having kids, I decided to sign up for a dating service. That's how I met George. From the first date, George was laid back and easygoing, the total opposite of me, who's always in a hurry and rather impatient. At times, I thought he was a bit unreliable, but then I realized that's something I can handle. I decided that George could fill the gap where I lack easygoingness and chose to marry him. George was raised by a single mother, but neither he nor his mom were interested in living together after we got married. The often told tales of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law conflicts had me relieved that neither of us wanted to live together. When I met my mother-in-law for the first time before our wedding, she seemed to be sizing me up with a critical stare. That confirmed my feelings that I didn't want to share a home with her. No living with my mother-in-law, and a new chapter begins with George as a married couple. We'll make compromises even when our values clash. That was my resolve. So, a month into our adjusted married life, something completely unexpected happened. Hello, Olive. How are you? Still no baby? I want to see my grandchild already. Hi, mother-in-law. It's been a while. What brings you here? What's in the bag? Oh, didn't George tell you? I've decided to move in. What? Of course, George had never mentioned any such plans to me. Both he and his mom had told me before our marriage that neither of them was interested in living together. So this was a complete curveball. Hey, mother-in-law's here at the house. She says she's moving in? What's going on? What? Mom did mention feeling lonely, but I never heard anything about moving in. I mean, I told her it was okay if she felt too lonely, but living together? I hid away to make the call, and when George said that, I unintentionally let out a what? Why did you say it was okay to live together without discussing it with me? She probably got the wrong idea. Aren't these the kind of decisions we should be making together? Well, I thought having mom around to help with chores might be nice. When I had greeted her at her home, The last thing I felt was that she could handle household chores. The kitchen was coated in dust, clearly untouched for a while, and the whole house was cluttered. It was nowhere near what you'd call neat. I want to enjoy my lunch, so I'm going to hang up now, he said, and abruptly ended the call. Just as I was getting used to life with George, the idea of adding mother-in-law to the equation was overwhelming. While I stood there in disbelief, my mother-in-law called me over, looking annoyed. Olive, your stuff is in the way. Move it already, will you? Honestly, you can't raise a kid in such a cramped house. Well, George and I have decided not to have kids. I'm 35 and George is 38. Having a baby past 35 is considered high risk, and I wanted to focus on my career. So, we had agreed before marriage to live a peaceful life just the two of us. I said that mainly to keep my mother-in-law at bay, so we wouldn't have to face daily nagging about grandchildren. But my words set off mother-in-law like a firecracker. Her face turned beet red with anger. Why? I can't believe you're married and not planning to have kids. I raised George all by myself, and you say you want to live a spoiled life? I respect that you raised George while working, but we've decided. I don't want to hear your excuses. You're the worst daughter-in-law. My attempt at pacifying mother-in-law had spectacularly backfired. She stayed furious and spent the next while berating me, not even allowing me room to defend myself. Hey, I can't live with mother-in-law. She's been making a big fuss about wanting grandkids again today. After George came home, I discreetly talked to him about the day's events in our bedroom. George, however, was only half listening. 
mostly engrossed in his smartphone, offering occasional disinterested replies like, hmm, really? Eventually, he put his phone down, got into bed, and closed his eyes. George, are you even listening? I was listening, but mom's lonely, so what can you do? I owe her for raising me as a single mother. I want to repay her kindness. So, Olive, you'll have to put up with it for a bit. My annoyance flared up at George, who, claiming he was tired from work, quickly drifted off to sleep. I was frustrated firstly with having to pacify my mother-in-law who's been going on and on about wanting grandkids, and secondly with George for unilaterally deciding we'd live with his mom. I'd heard that marriages are built on compromise. I knew families successfully managed to live with in-laws. Day one was a disaster, but to continue my life with George, it looked like I'd have to be the one making sacrifices. Waking George up to vent my anger was out of the question, so I accepted our living situation. Later, I'd realized this choice was a mistake. I often found myself wishing I'd shaken George awake that night, given him an ultimatum between his mom and me. Because the next day, mother-in-law's harassment began. Olive, just because you work doesn't mean you can slack on housework. George and I are starving, so hurry up and make dinner. Uh, okay. When I got home from work, George had already returned and was watching TV with mother-in-law in the living room. George isn't someone who can't cook. Before, if I came home late, he would have dinner ready for me. Yet today, for some reason, he'd done nothing. Even the dishes from the morning were still in the sink. He seemed to be enjoying a quiz show with mother-in-law while I was left to prepare dinner alone in the kitchen. When I finally laid out the meal on the table, mother-in-law twisted her lips in disapproval again. What's this? Mostly frozen food, huh? You think it's okay to feed this additive packed stuff to an elderly person? I'm sorry, I've been busy with work. Being busy with work is no excuse. Has George been eating like this every day since you got married? Poor guy. If his health goes south, it's on you. While mother-in-law angrily scolds me, Spitting as she speaks, George quietly eats his meal. George, who side glances at the TV and seems to be enjoying himself while his wife is being yelled at by mother-in-law, doesn't seem like the George I know. Throughout dinner, mother-in-law never stopped complaining at me. A wife who can't even cook and won't have kids is the worst. George could have done so much better. Prioritize George and me over your job. She kept going on and on until I was so mentally worn down, I couldn't even understand what she was saying anymore. That night, I broke down crying in our bedroom. The thought of this life continuing was unbearable. George seemed surprised to see me cry. I told him I can't live with mother-in-law anymore, but George looked exasperated. My mom is important to me, so I want you to treat her with respect too he said before falling asleep. I couldn't even muster a rebuttal to George and cried until I fell asleep. Life with mother-in-law, filled with nothing but suffering, continued as it was. George doesn't have to do a thing. Housework is a wife's job. Once mother-in-law said this, George truly stopped doing any chores. I continued to juggle work, household tasks, and being yelled at by mother-in-law. When mother-in-law found out George and I had separate finances, she started demanding money from me. You're my son's wife, so giving me an allowance is your natural duty. She demanded money with this ridiculous reasoning. I was so tired of being yelled at that I just gave her the money, thinking if it could be solved with cash, so be it. My home no longer felt like a place to relax. When heading back home after work, my feet felt as heavy as lead. I spent days wondering how long this life would continue, feeling utterly hopeless. Then, a pivotal incident occurred. I'm home. What's going on? Come here for a second. I arrived home that day, burdened with yet more emotional stress. Waiting for me at the entrance was George, his face twisted in anger. George, who had greeted me at the entrance, pulls me into the living room. There, sitting on the sofa, mother-in-law looked downcast. Did something happen? 
This is all Olive's fault, isn't it? You must have done something. It was the first time I had ever seen George angry. Although I was shocked, I wrecked my brain. I had no recollection of doing anything to make mother-in-law feel this way. Feeling agitated, George finally told me what was bothering him. I heard you've been making snide remarks to my mom every day when I'm not around. She even told me you only cook when I'm here, so she's not getting meals. What's your aim in being nasty to my mom? I was dumbfounded and couldn't speak. George had fallen for the lies mother-in-law had fed him. It was mother-in-law who had been making snide comments when George wasn't around, even complaining about the food like, isn't this too salty? It looks awful. Yet I had never stopped serving meals. I was certain I had fulfilled all of mother-in-law's demands. I haven't done any of that. I cook even when you're not here and I've never made any nasty comments. Stop lying. As George scolded me, mother-in-law looked over his shoulder at me and grinned slyly. George had decided that I was lying and took mother-in-law's words as truth. Looking at George like this made me feel like my head would explode. Maybe this is what people mean when they say they've woken up. As George continued to rage, he snapped at me. Get out. Go back to your parents' home and reflect on yourself. Sure, I'll reflect. I really had to reflect. I had to reflect on why I had been wearing myself thin, serving people like this. I quietly packed my things and left the house. When I got to my parents' house and explained the situation, they were shocked at my appearance. I hadn't realized it, but the stress from living with mother-in-law had caused me to lose a significant amount of weight. Holding me in her arms, my mom cried, I wish I had never approved of this marriage. My dad said, You don't ever have to go back. Luckily, my parents' home was a commutable distance to my job, so I took them up on their offer and started my life afresh at their house. Every now and then, I'd get an email from George checking in on me, but I left them all unread. As I worked hard and relaxed at my parents' home, I felt like I was breaking free from the brainwashing. I used to think that to keep my marriage to George, I had to endure whatever mother-in-law said. But a marriage with a husband who prioritizes his mother over his wife is not worth keeping. It took quite some time before I could look back and laugh at what a fool I'd been. Have you cooled your head yet? Yes, I feel much clearer now. Thanks for sending me back to my parents. Months passed and I returned to the house where George and mother-in-law lived. George was waiting at the front door. I smiled and headed toward the living room. Mother-in-law was seated, glaring at me as I entered. You're late. Being away this long is unacceptable for a wife. You owe George and me an apology for what you've done and for leaving this house unattended. Mother-in-law spoke loudly and George agreed as he sat next to her. Without sitting down, I pulled out some documents from my bag. I won't apologize. However, I don't want to make either of you uncomfortable anymore, so I've prepared this. Both George and mother-in-law's eyes widened when they saw the papers I placed on the table. The document was a pre-filled divorce application. D divorce Hold on, Olive. I never thought about divorcing if you just apologized to my mom. Don't get it twisted. I'm the one who wants to divorce. I'm tired of being yelled at by mother-in-law every day and being treated like a maid. I thought I was doing it all for you, George, but it seems you care more about your mom than me. I don't see the need to value someone who doesn't value me. I realized that after clearing my head at my parents' house. I expected George to be shaken. However, I was surprised to see mother-in-law trembling as well. Now, Olive, calm down. Divorcing is a hasty decision. Maybe I've been harsh on you, but it's not that I hate you. I just wanted you to become a respectable wife. I don't want to become a respectable wife as you see it, so thanks, but no thanks. What's making you so nervous? Is it because you had a hard time without your free and limited housemaid for these few months? Mother-in-law couldn't argue with my statement. 
The house I'd kept clean despite all of mother-in-law's criticisms was a mess after just a few months of my absence. Clearly, housekeeping wasn't mother-in-law's strong suit. I came here today to deliver the divorce papers. If you're not willing to agree to the divorce, I've decided to consult a lawyer. Please mail it back as soon as you've signed. Goodbye. I left George and mother-in-law, both looking pale and downcast, and walked out of the house. Finally saying what I needed to say, I felt refreshed as I headed back to my parents' home. Shortly after, George promptly mailed me the completed divorce papers. I easily got my divorce and returned to a life where work is my primary relationship. I'm truly happy living life on my own terms now. As for George and mother-in-law, they seem to be living quietly in their dust-filled home. When I told the matchmaker who had set us up about our divorce, I was shocked to hear that George had re-registered with the dating service. He's apparently looking for a new housekeeper, but given his age and divorce history, his search for a life partner isn't going well. I had resigned myself to staying single forever after the ordeal, but recently a younger colleague told me he's interested in dating with marriage in mind. I'm unsure what to respond, but the truth is I'm growing fond of this adorable puppy-like person. We're in the stage of going on dates, and I have a feeling I'll end up being swept off my feet by this colleague. Here's hoping this marriage works out better than the last. My name is Madison. I'm 31 years old and work as a nurse. The way I met my husband, Nicholas, who is two years older than me, is like something out of a drama. Nurse, meet, inpatient. We got to know each other after I messed up his IV, embarrassing to admit as a nurse. I wish I could forget it, but hey, we're married now. Life is unpredictable. I work at a general hospital, which includes night shifts. When I come home after a night shift, my husband is on his way to work. We might not always cross paths, but for the most part, we were doing well as a couple. One day, we both had the day off and planned to go out. That's when my younger sister Abigail showed up unannounced. When we told her we were about to go out, she excitedly said, Really? I was thinking of going shopping too. Let's go to the store and... And just like that, she decided where we were going. My husband chuckled and said, Well, it's fine. We hadn't decided where to go anyway. But we rarely get to go out together. She's your only sister and she misses you. It's cute, isn't it? At that, my sister started playfully hitting my husband on the arm, saying, Oh my god, you're calling me cute. That's so sweet. My sister has always been like this. Good at buttering people up. Good at getting pampered. Even my parents were the same. Everybody always spoils her. Growing up, I was always told to be the mature older sister, compared and even made to hold back sometimes. Honestly, she's not my favorite person. I thought getting married and moving out meant finally getting some distance, but no. She has a knack for showing up and making me sigh. Our outing ended up being all about where she wanted to go. She kept asking us to buy this and that. I said no, but my husband ended up paying for it all anyway. Apparently, being an only child, he's a soft spot for the concept of a little sister. You're so kind. I'm so happy you're my brother-in-law, she said, wrapping her arm around my husband. My husband doesn't even try to shake her off. They walk together like a couple, and I follow behind them. It's the only way to describe how miserable I feel. After that, my sister started visiting more frequently. Having just graduated from college and failing to find a job, she's supposedly a homemaker but it seems she doesn't actually do any housework. So she's just unemployed and hanging around the house. She's not even working part-time and our parents are okay with this. With time on her hands, she started spending more than half the week at our place. I'm not thrilled about it, but since my husband is happy to have her, I can't exactly turn her away. Once I told her it's inconvenient for her to come over so often, she broke down and said, you're a terrible sister, do you hate me? Upon seeing this, my husband lashed out, Hey, aren't you being too harsh on your sister? What a cold-hearted sibling you are. Our parents chimed in with the same old line, You're the older sister, take care of her. Despite her being so adorable, I labeled the cold sister. Not very nice at all. Always the same story. Our parents dote on my sister and treat me poorly. It was the same when I said I wanted to go to nursing school. We don't have the money, they hesitated. When I said I would pay for it with money from my part-time job... Guess what they said? Use that money for your sister. That's what they told me. At that moment, I gave up 
expecting anything from my parents. I gave up on being loved by them. In the end, I went to nursing school without giving in and they didn't help me at all. Despite claiming to have no money, they paid my sister's college tuition. Apparently, they still give her an allowance every month. Then and now, for our parents, the only beloved daughter is my sister. I see the same trend in my husband. Everyone seems to think my sister is the virtuous one, and I'm the villain. It's an incredibly sad reality. To add insult to injury, my husband's attitude towards me starts to change. He's become somewhat colder. You can't even handle basic chores, and you call yourself a housewife? You're completely useless. You know your current lifestyle is all thanks to me, right? Show some gratitude. You've got plenty of clothes. Stop wasting money when you earn so little. Uh, if only you were more beautiful. What bad luck I have being stuck with a charmless wife like you. The verbal abuse just kept getting worse, and his spending grew increasingly reckless. When confronted, he'd lash out. And then, I saw my sister smirking as she watched us fight. That's when I realized. My husband and my sister were having an affair. I hadn't seen it happen, but I could feel it in the air. Call it a woman's intuition, if you will. My sister being overly touchy and needy with my husband, and him responding with a sloppy grin. Initially, I cried almost every night, but slowly my sadness turned to rage. Wondering what to do about this, an incident occurred one day. My sister was rushed to the hospital where I work. Seeing her on a stretcher, I was shocked. Even more when I heard her husband was with her. Wait, husband? When did my sister get married? Was I the only one not in the know? No way that can't be. While I was still confused, a man stepped out of the ambulance. Yes, it was my husband, not hers. Definitely mine. Abigail, hang in there. I'm with you. He shouted, unaware of my presence. I quietly approached him from behind and whispered into his ear. What are you up to? What do you mean? My wife is collapsing. Wait, wife? Infuriated, he turned around and was visibly shocked when he recognized me. My wife has collapsed. Wait, what? What do you mean, what? Why are you here? I work here. Remember the name of your wife's workplace. So, while I'm working, you and Abigail were together again? That's none of your business. How is it none of my business when it involves my sister and my husband? Explain yourself. If he admits to cheating, fine. I can divorce him without any lingering feelings. Even if he apologizes, I have no intention of forgiving him. With that in mind, I awaited his reply. Shut up! My husband suddenly snapped. His face turned bright red. His mouth twisted in anger. What an ugly sight he made. Shut up? You're telling me to shut up. Damn right, shut up! You have no say in this. What Abigail and I do is none of your business. What a transformation. He had become distant since his involvement with Abigail, but he had never yelled at me like this. What's with the attitude? It's weird for a husband and sister to spend so much time alone. Are you feeling guilty or something? Explain. Shut up, shut up, shut up! Your job is to work and make money. Don't you dare challenge your husband. With that, he pushed me hard. I stumbled and fell on my butt. Wincing in pain, I watched him walk away. I was at a loss for words. Blinded by rage, I hardly remembered what happened afterwards. I simply focused on my nursing job. It turns out my sister had fainted at my house due to anemia. Should I be relieved it wasn't a life-threatening illness? As I left the hospital room, I saw my parents there with my husband. Their faces were pale with concern for their beloved Abigail. Madison, is Abigail okay? Would they be this worried if I were the one hospitalized? No, probably not. I pushed the thought aside and assured them it wasn't serious and she could be discharged soon. Then I looked at my husband. So, are you going to explain? Are you seeing Abigail alone often? He looked uncomfortable at my question. Yeah, so what? I'm not asking if it's wrong, I'm asking if you're having an affair with my sister. My parents looked shocked. My husband's eyes widened, then narrowed. So you noticed? I thought you were too dense to realize. What a brazen admission. Yes, I'm involved with Abigail. But so what? I'm just showing her some affection. You can't even make decent money or keep the house in order. Who are you to complain? How dare you say that? It's the truth. You've lost your appeal, so don't act high and mighty. The one having an affair shouldn't be acting high and mighty. What did you just say? You... We were both losing our tempers. As I stood my ground, he grabbed my collar. I braced myself to be hit, but then someone grabbed his arm. Calm down, both of you. It was the doctor who had examined my sister. Although he looked close to 40 years old and seemed calm, he gripped my husband's arm with strong force, contrary to his expression. My husband tried to shake free, but the doctor's grip didn't let go. You're in a hospital. Please keep it down, and no violence. The doctor's tone was gentle, but firm. It seemed to have an impact, and my husband reluctantly let go of my hand. At the same time, 
The doctor also released his grip on my husband. By the way, the doctor stepped between my husband and me, blocking my view. I can only see the doctor's back. I wonder what face he's making while looking at my husband. The patient is pregnant. What? Confused, my husband listened as the doctor repeated himself. She's pregnant, early stages. She probably wasn't even aware. Make sure she's paying attention to her diet. She'll be needing more iron during pregnancy. My sister is pregnant. The room went silent, grasping the weight of this revelation. What followed was chaotic. My sister, now discharged, was pampered like a princess back at her parents' home. Being the first grandchild, our parents were ecstatic beyond words. As for my husband, he showed no remorse. Not only did he not apologize, he even said it was my fault he had an affair. Without any lingering attachments, we divorced swiftly. Of course, I claimed alimony. Greedy woman. He grumbled to the very end, but ultimately signed the papers. Was being with my sister that important to him? The years spent with him felt empty, to say the least. That's the sad part of the story. I'll probably be embarrassed about it forever, but it's not over. Why should everything end here? I can't forgive them. My sister, my husband, and my parents. I've already submitted the divorce papers. After confirming the alimony transfer, I head straight to my family home. My sister, my parents, and even my ex-husband were all there. I originally purchased that apartment when I was single, so inevitably, my ex-husband left. When I entered my parents' house, my ex-husband, parents, and sister were all there. I've confirmed the alimony payment and submitted the divorce papers. Oh, really? My ex-husband was as indifferent as ever. We've submitted our marriage registration, too. I'm Abigail's husband now, so stop bothering us. Who said anything about bothering? How can he act so high and mighty after having an affair? Even more. Why is he so full of himself? I don't have any ounce of love left for him. These delusional comments are making me sick. I pulled out a letter-sized envelope, my face stern. So, shall we begin? What's that? I have to say, I'm impressed. I spoke up, cutting off my husband's puzzled question. I eagerly pulled out a thick stack of papers from the envelope. There were also small bundles of paper. I placed them on the table and tapped them with my finger. Never thought you'd be raising someone else's child. You're practically a saint, aren't you? What? My husband furrowed his eyebrows, clueless about what I was getting at. I sensed my sister catching her breath. Ignoring them, I spread the papers out. What's this? It's the result from a private investigator. I answered while they were still asking. No time to waste. A private investigator? Why would you- Hold on, don't rush me. These papers have all kinds of information about Abigail. About Abigail? My husband looked at my sister's face. It seemed to have turned slightly pale. What exactly are you? It might not matter to mom and dad. The child is Abigail's after all. Huh? This right here is about the man Abigail is dating. I said, showing them a photograph. It featured my sister arm in arm with a man. It wasn't my ex-husband. Huh? What? My bewildered ex-husband and parents, my sister lost for words. Ah, in the moment of revenge. Surprise! The child in my sister's belly is this man's. I grinned and declared loudly. What? What's going on? Abigail, what is this about? I pressed on against the stunned trio. The truth is, Abigail has been dating this man. The child is unmistakably his. Weren't you two using contraception? Well, yes, but contraception isn't absolute. True, nothing is absolute, but the timing doesn't add up based on what I've heard. That's not absolute either, but the timeline for her relationship with this man aligns perfectly with her pregnancy. So chances are... When I saw proof of my husband and sister's affair, I stumbled upon an unexpected revelation. Stop making stuff up. I don't know this man. That's right, Madison. You can't ruin a relationship with lies. Oh, really? So is this picture photoshopped? I spread out a couple of pictures on the table, one showing my sister checking into a hotel with a man and another showing them leaving. Then I spread out a slew of lovey-dovey pictures that obviously couldn't have been edited. Wow, look at you two all cozy. What are you doing? Clean this up. Throw them away. Don't worry, I have digital copies. I can make as many as I want. Are you kidding me? My sister is panicking. This is getting fun. I should mention that this relationship between my sister and this man dates back a few years since Abigail was in college. Wait, that long ago? Abigail, you said you didn't have a boyfriend. I, I, I don't, I swear. Well, can't really call him a boyfriend, can we? Because he's a married man. He's what? Married? My ex-husband's voice cracked. What's there to be surprised about? You were married too. Seems like my sister has a thing for married men. Abigail, 
You were serious about him, weren't you? Um, you wanted to have his child, didn't you? That's, you wanted a child because he wasn't going to leave his wife, am I right? My sister was silenced by my questions. I looked at my ex-husband and pointed sharply at him. So, you're just a convenient option. What? My ex-husband's eyes widened. Pretty impressive considering you'd marry and raise a child that isn't yours. Well, it's not the child's fault, so you better take good care of them. Wait, if that's true... If what's true? Let's start over. What? I was caught off guard by a sudden statement. What's he talking about? Start over. Yes! If Abigail's child isn't mine, then I'll break up with her. Why should I raise someone else's child? So why would you want to start over with me? You still love me, right? I can put up with your quirks if you continue to provide for me as, as you have. Bang! I couldn't take it anymore and slammed the table. Photos and documents flew everywhere. I glared at my ex-husband. You've got to be kidding me. Ah! You think I'm so stupid that I get back with the man who cheated on me with my sister? Love you. I think of you as less than trash. Even if you'd offered me a billion dollars, I'd say no. Ew, really? A sleazy man who hits on his wife's sister and a sleazy woman who would let him raise another man's child? You two are a match made in heaven. Just stay out of my life. That goes for you too, mom and dad. I'll find happiness without any of you. I left my family home after dropping these words. Wait, wait up! My ex-husband desperately tried to catch up to me. He reached out his hand to me, but it was intercepted by someone else. Who the heck are you? My name is David. I won't allow anyone to harm Madison. It was the doctor who had treated my sister before. David. He had saved me that day from my ex-husband's blow. We became close while I consulted him about various issues. David, who also experienced divorce due to his wife's infidelity, he confessed his feelings for me. I was shocked. I asked him to wait until the divorce was finalized. He respected my wish. He had been waiting outside today, concerned about the meeting. I'll call the police if you try anything. And if you cross the line, I'll see you right away. But Madison, please wait. I was wrong. So wrong. I grinned at my weeping ex-husband. Thanks to you and my sister, I met him. Thank you. I'm going to be happy with him. My ex-husband slumped as he watched me hug David. After that... We DNA tested my sister's child after its birth. As suspected, the child was not my ex-husband's. My sister and ex-husband ended up divorcing. My sister had to pay damages for her affair once her lover's wife found out. She's now reluctantly working night shifts. As for my parents, they dote on their grandchild, believing blood is thicker than water. It seems their love has shifted from my sister to her child, and my sister doesn't like it. I'm being neglected, my sister complained, but I don't care. Her child is likely to follow in her footsteps. I wonder what my aging parents will do then. Not my problem. Word got around at my ex-husband's workplace about his affairs and quick divorce, so now he's ostracized. He got uncomfortable and quit his job. Then he hopped from job to job, his mental state deteriorating, and eventually became unemployed. Nobody knows what he's up to now. A mutual friend told me this, but honestly, I couldn't care less. He brought this upon himself. Oh yeah, right. As for me, my relationship with David is going well. We are cautious about moving forward because we both have been cheated on. But his sincerity has eased my worries. I'm pretty sure the day I become Mrs. Johnson isn't far off. My sister dumped her corporate boyfriend and stole my fiancé. All because she found out he worked at a hospital. Thanks for handing over a doctor boyfriend to me. <laughs> my sister shamelessly brags about marrying my ex, but she's got one thing wrong. He's not a doctor. I can't wait to see her face when she finds out. My name is Beatrice. I have a younger sister named Catherine, just a year apart. We're not on bad terms or anything, but ever since we were kids, Catherine has always tried to outdo me. She's never satisfied unless she's better than me. Hey, sis, did you get your test back today? Yeah, just got my math test back. Let me see. Ah, just as I thought, I scored higher again. Whenever she scores higher, she flaunts it to our parents. Our parents often praise Catherine more, the one who's always seeking attention over the quiet me. In middle school, Catherine joined the same badminton club as me. Let's have a match, sis. By beating me, a senior, Catherine became the star of the club. Whether at school or home, Catherine always got the spotlight. Whenever I tried something, she'd do the same, always trying to outshine me. 
Still, I never disliked her. Her competitive nature was endearing, and watching her succeed wasn't so bad. But looking back, she probably saw my attitude as being smug. Catherine started to see me as a rival. I was decent at both studies and sport, but I wasn't the type to show off like Catherine. So I wasn't really popular at school. On the other hand, Catherine was always the center of attention, and often got confessions from boys. You know, a boy from your class confessed to me. Even though you're closer to him, he chose me. Guess I'm more attractive. <laughs> Catherine believed that being popular with boys proved her superiority over me. She started dating multiple boys, sometimes even bringing them home to show off. Sorry for showing off, sis. <laughs> She'd act all lovey-dovey with her boyfriend at home, as if to flaunt it to me. But I'm the type who wants a long-term relationship, so I wasn't envious of her frequent change of boyfriends. Noticing this, Catherine began to brag about the quality of her boyfriends. My current boyfriend goes to Stanford. I also got a confession from a guy at MIT. It was hard to choose. <laughs> Throughout college, Catherine dated many guys. After graduation, she started bragging about their jobs instead of their schools. My new boyfriend works at a listed company. A successful man is the best, right? <laughs> Eventually, she introduced her boyfriend to our family, saying she wanted to marry him. This is Bradley. He's an elite working for a trading company. He said I could even quit my job and become a housewife after we marry. Bradley, a year older than Catherine, seemed calm and listened to Catherine's stories with a smile. Sorry, I'm getting married before you, sis. If I waited for you, I'd become a grandma. <laughs> Hearing this, Mom looked puzzled. Wait, didn't Beatrice have someone she's dating too? Uh, yeah. I hadn't told Catherine because I didn't want her to feel competitive, but I actually have a fiancé too. Upon hearing this, Catherine bombarded me with questions. Who is he? Do you have a picture? What does he do? How much does he earn? I had anticipated this reaction, which is why I hadn't wanted to tell her in the first place. Seeing my hesitation, Catherine suggested a double date. Why don't we all go out for dinner? You and your boyfriend and me and Bradley. That should be fine, right? I wasn't thrilled, but I figured it would satisfy your curiosity. I asked my boyfriend, Reggie, and he agreed. On the day of the date, as soon as Catherine met Reggie, she asked, Where do you work, Reggie? My Bradley works for a trading company. I work at a hospital. A hospital? Hearing Reggie worked at a hospital, Catherine's face changed instantly. Why didn't you tell me your boyfriend was a doctor? I would have preferred a doctor over a corporate guy. Without waiting for my response, Catherine bombarded Reggie with questions. Which university did you graduate from, Reggie? Well, it's a specialized field, so I'd rather not say. Were you from a wealthy family? My current income doesn't even come close to what my dad made. You must have had an accomplished father. Catherine left her boyfriend and chatted nonstop with Reggie. While Catherine and Reggie were engrossed in their conversation, Bradley and I had a casual chat over drinks. If Bradley wasn't such a calm and mature man, he probably would have snapped at Catherine and Reggie. Only someone as patient as him could handle being with Catherine. I hoped this would satisfy her. I even rescheduled a gourmet festival event I was supposed to attend with Reggie to the following weekend. I planned to indulge Reggie's whims on our next date. However, the next week, Reggie suddenly canceled. Beatrice, about our date tomorrow, I got swamped with work. That's okay, I'm sorry for rescheduling in the first place. We decided to spend the weekend separately. With a sudden free weekend, I decided to attend the event alone. On my way, I heard a familiar voice from behind. Beatrice? I turned to see Bradley. Oh, Bradley, are you here for the event too? What a coincidence. Catherine suddenly had work and canceled our date. That's just like me. I was supposed to come with Reggie, but he got caught up with work and had to cancel. Bradley mentioned he learned about the event from Catherine and was interested. Did Catherine know about this event too? I had a bad feeling. Entering the venue, my worst fears were confirmed. I spotted Catherine, arm in arm with Reggie, laughing and enjoying themselves. Unable to hide my shock, I approached my sister. Catherine? Reggie? What's going on here? While Reggie looked uncomfortable, Catherine seemed smug. Isn't it obvious? I've decided to date Reggie. What are you talking about? Reggie is my boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend, right? Reggie seems to enjoy my company more than yours. But you have Bradley. Bradley, standing next to me, seemed lost for words. Catherine glanced at him and said dismissively, Perfect timing. Bradley, let's break up. I've fallen for Reggie. Bradley's eyes widened. Are you serious? 
Of course, being a corporate wife is fine, but being a doctor's wife is way more appealing. I was too stunned to process Catherine's words. She had not only stolen my boyfriend, but also dumped hers without a second thought. I couldn't hide my disgust at her actions. Without any remorse, Catherine linked arms with Reggie and left. I can't do it anymore for my little sister, who doesn't even have a shred of ethics like that. I decided to distance myself from such a selfish sister. I didn't contact Catherine after that. It was six months later when she called me. Hey, good sis. I got married. Married? Don't tell me. Yes, to Reggie. Hee <laughs> hee. She was reporting her marriage to the boyfriend she stole from me. She continued gleefully. You're too plain for someone like Reggie. That's why I took him from you. <laughs> I had moved on from Reggie in those six months. After all, he was the kind of guy who shifted his attention from me to Catherine. I didn't miss him. I replied calmly. Oh, so you got married, so did he pay off all his debts? That's what are you talking about. He didn't tell you? What had concerned me during our relationship was Reggie's gambling addiction. He was deeply in debt due to his gambling habits. We were waiting for him to pay off his gambling debts before getting married. I... I had no idea. It seems Reggie hadn't told Catherine about his gambling or his debts. Catherine was momentarily speechless, but quickly regained her composure. Well, Reggie can pay it off quickly. After all, he's a doctor. He must earn more than a corporate guy like Bradley. Thanks for giving me a doctor boyfriend. <laughs> I realized Catherine was still under a misconception. I decided to enlighten her. He's not a doctor. He's actually unemployed. What? But he said he worked at a hospital. He did work at a hospital. As a janitor. <laughs> it's all about how you phrase it. <laughs> but he went to a good college and comes from a wealthy family, right? He went to a vocational school. That's why he didn't specify when you asked about his college. As for his family, they're just average. His dad, a regular office worker, probably earns more than jobless Reggie. <laughs> Catherine was speechless, and rightfully so. She switched from Bradley to Reggie because of the supposed salary difference, only to find out that Reggie was just a casual worker, incomparable to a corporate employee like Bradley. After hanging up with me, Catherine apparently confronted Reggie. He confessed that he wasn't going to work every day, but was gambling. That wasn't all. Upon their marriage, he had made Catherine the co-signer for his debts. Desperate, Catherine turned to her parents for help, but the debt was too much for her retired parents to handle. Next, she reached out to her ex-boyfriend, Bradley. I, who was at Bradley's place, answered her call. What? Why are you at Bradley's place? We've been dating since then. Hearing this, Catherine erupted in anger. What? How dare you date my ex-boyfriend, you traitor? Now it was my turn to be furious. You started all of this. I only started dating Bradley after you dumped him. Who in their right mind steals our sister's boyfriend? Bradley took over the call, turning on the speaker so I could hear. From the other end, Catherine's desperate voice came through. Oh, Bradley, long time no see. How have you been? Yeah, I'm good now. Beatrice helped me get through the tough times after you left. You're really dating her. She took advantage of you when you were vulnerable. You deserve better than her. Bradley responded coldly. Beatrice is an amazing woman, far better than you. I could almost hear Catherine stomping her foot in frustration. What? Are you saying I'm inferior to her? I've always been better than her in studies, sports, everything. Well, maybe in character, she's superior. That's not true. I've always been more popular, had more friends, and boyfriends. Having many boyfriends isn't something to brag about. A woman who can commit to one relationship is far more admirable. That's just what unpopular girls say. You're only with her because I dumped you. I can come back to you if you want. Uh, no thanks. I can't see myself marrying someone who only looks at titles. It's only natural to know about your partner before marriage. All you wanted to know was his salary, right? Even if you did marry, you'd jump ship as soon as a better offer came along. That's not true. Really? That's exactly what you did on our date. I, I didn't. Struggling for words, Bradley looked at me and continued. Even after learning about his debt, Beatrice never abandoned him. She was willing to think together about how to repay the debt and how to cure his gambling addiction. And she silently stepped back without a word of resentment towards the boyfriend who easily betrayed her. Seeing her so different from you, I was increasingly drawn to her. That's impossible, choosing her over me. To be honest, I can't believe I ever considered marrying you. I'm just glad I realized it before making that mistake. Wait, you can't show off someone plain like Beatrice to others. If you're going to marry, it should be with someone like me. Are you an idiot? You don't marry to show off to others. You marry because you want to spend your life with someone, and that someone is definitely not you. It's Beatrice. With that, Bradley hung up. Then he turned to me. Beatrice, 
I guess that conversation was kind of a proposal, but let me ask you formally, will you marry me? I joyfully accepted Bradley's proposal. Yes, if you'll have me. Our married life was smooth sailing. He told me, you can be a stay-at-home mom if you want, but unlike Catherine, I never aspired to be one. I love my current job, so even after getting married, I chose to continue working. When I was dating Reggie, I was worried if he would help with household chores if we both work, but Bradley steps out saying, we both work after all. He willingly takes on household tasks. Now, I genuinely feel grateful for marrying him. On the other hand, Catherine still seems to be with Reggie, unable to break up with him. Reggie's gambling addiction hasn't changed. He occasionally gets a part-time job, but he usually spends all his earnings on gambling the same day. Catherine, far from being a stay-at-home mom, seems to be working all the time, day and night, to cover Reggie's share of the expenses. It's the complete opposite of the married life she had imagined. My younger sister, who was so fixated on having a better life than me, now seems to be far behind in terms of quality of life. However, it's all due to her own choices. Her current situation is the result of betraying me. The one who probably regrets the most is Catherine herself.